as a heart surgeon, I don't really cure the heart. I can't make the heart normal. What I'm trying to do is convert the child's heart defect into something that can be more easily treated throughout his or her life. What is congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries or CCTGA? Historically, people bored with CCTGA tended to do fairly well. Why is it today doctors are choosing to operate on the hearts of babies born with CCTGA? What does Dr. Edward Bobe think about the future of babies born with CCTGA? Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of this program. I am also a heart mom. My son, Alexander, was born with a critical congenital heart defect, and he's had three open heart surgeries. He is now post-spontan and my inspiration. He is the reason I am the host of your program. Today's show features a very informed heart mom and a world-renowned cardiothoracic surgeon. Our episode is entitled, Learning About CCTGA and the Double Switch Procedure. Erin Beckemeyer is mom to Conway, born in 2007 with CCTGA, a large ventricular septal defect, or VSD, and subpulmonic stenosis. He was later diagnosed with an epstenoid tricuspid valve. At six months of age, he had an arterial switch with ascending, which is a double switch, VSD closure, and resection of the stenosis. Conway's recovery from these procedures was rocky as he suffered a seizure and complete heart block requiring a dual-chambered pacemaker. By two years of age, he was struggling with atrial flutter and underwent a mitral annuloplasty and ablation maze procedure. At five years, his right ventricular PA conduit was replaced and he was upgraded to a biventricular or CRT pacing system. The new atrial lead became infected and was removed the following month. At age 14, he received two new leads and his fourth pacemaker. Due to a significant growth spurt, his mitral valve, RVPA, homographed, and left ventricular function are being closely monitored. Erin lives with her husband, Greg, and their five children. She is a fourth grade teacher. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Erin Beckemeyer. Anna, thank you so much for having me and inviting me on this program today. Well, I am so excited to talk to you and to learn so much more. Your son has so many conditions. I think we're going to be learning a lot. But let's start with your son being diagnosed with congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries or CCTGA and the options that you were given. Okay. Conway was diagnosed in March of 2007 when he was two days old. When my water broke, meconium was present. So they actually called in the NICU team for his delivery. They gave him a thorough exam and he was cleared to stay in my postpartum room. He was away from me for what seemed like a lot longer of a time compared to my firstborn when they took him for his bath and to clean him up. When he finally returned, the nurses let me know they detected a murmur But not to worry because 50% of babies have one at birth and it usually goes away in the first 24 hours or so. So he remained with me in my postpartum room, nursing like a champ and generally being the sweetest, most calm baby. After 24 hours, I was told his murmur was a bit louder than they liked. So the protocol was to take his vitals every three hours. He still stayed with me, but just had more visits from the nurses who checked his blood pressure, his pulse ox saturations and his heart rate. Every single time he aced all their tests and we were reassured that things were really fine. On day two, as I was packing up to leave the hospital while his circumcision was being done, the phone rang in my hospital room. It was our pediatrician telling me they were admitting Conway to the NICU for observation because they had discovered a potentially surgical heart defect. Oh my goodness. They discovered it while he was being circumcised? Well, I guess the pediatrician felt uncomfortable with the murmur and ordered an echo. And so they had circumcised him and then they took him in and did this echo unbeknownst to me. Oh my goodness, Aaron. Wow. So here you were completely prepared to go home. You already had at least one little one at home waiting for you. Correct. My goodness. Okay. 
Wow. I just dropped the phone. I ran out into the hall to try to find anyone, a nurse or somebody to just take me to my son. He was in the special care nursery, still undergoing his first echocardiogram. The echo tech was there as well as a pediatric cardiologist. And the doctor introduced himself and explained all the problems that Conway had and how they were actually working together in such a way that he was balanced and stable for the time being. Okay. He drew us an image like lots of the doctors do at the time of diagnosis, one of a normal heart and one of Conway's heart side by side so we could see visually what was going on. And he explained to us that the plan was that he would just be admitted for observation for 48 hours, not so much because he needed anything, just to reassure everyone that his status was truly stable. And so we were told of a relatively new surgery, and it was highly complex, but that it could correct his problems and give him the best chance at a normal life. But it had to wait until he was 15 pounds to be big enough to be on the heart-lung bypass machine for as long of a time as he would need to be on it. Okay. So they thought he would be a candidate for a procedure called the double switch, where his plumbing would be changed around to enable the ventricles to do the jobs that they were designed to do. We were told it was a very risky surgery with about a 90% success rate. And my husband and I actually thought 90% sounded pretty good, given that in school, that's just about an A. Right. But doctor (laughs) said that, no, for most congenital heart defect surgeries, success rates were closer to 97, 98%. He did tell us that some people with CCTGA don't undergo this double switch. Right. Uh, But with his accompanying defects, he was going to require open heart surgery regardless. His VSD was so large that they would have had to close it anyway. And the pulmonic stenosis below the pulmonary valve would have to be resected anyway. He felt that his best option for a longer life with a higher quality of life would be to undergo the double switch. And he believed that without it, we would be facing heart failure before he was school age. Oh, my goodness. That is so much information to be bombarded with postpartum. Honestly, I just kind of went into denial. I just remember telling my husband laying on the hospital bed and just kind of rocking back and forth and saying, I wish they could just put him back inside because when he was in there, everything was fine. Yes. Oh my goodness. I know. Oh, wow. You got a crash course in what the heart does (laughs) (laughs) and how Conway's heart was not doing everything the way that most people's hearts do things. Wow. You found out right away that he was going to need all of these procedures. Do any of your other children have heart defects too? No, he was our second child together. And our daughter, who was born two years before him, was completely healthy. We had an uncomplicated pregnancy and delivery with her. I had suffered a miscarriage just prior to conceiving him. And one between him and our next son, who was born when Conway was three, And then we went on to have two more children, a daughter who's six years younger than Conway and a son who is 11 years younger. So we currently have a rising junior, a freshman who is Connie, a sixth grader, a third grader, and one starting in preschool in the fall. So knowing about his heart did lead us to have fetal echoes performed during our subsequent pregnancies, as well as echoes before they got discharged from the hospital after they were born. Mm -hmm. And they all checked out structurally perfect. His older sister, we went ahead and had an echo done on her just to be extra sure, and that was also normal. Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. 
If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Before the break, we were talking with Aaron and learning about Conway's heart condition. In this segment, we'll learn more about Conway, including learning about his health after his surgeries and what he's up to today. Aaron, how was Conway's double switch operation and recovery? Well, as it turned out, Conway's double switch was not without complication. In fact, it felt like he struggled with just about most of the risks listed on the consent form. His anatomy did prove a bit more complex than it had appeared initially on echo. And it took a lot of creativity from Dr. Beauvais due to the position of his VSD. He suffered from complete heart block and his AV node never bounced back. And he spiked several fevers throughout the recovery, even though the cause was never really found. He was found to have an allergy to an antibiotic that they were using to fight what they thought was sepsis. And the most impactful complication was a grand mal seizure that took place about 30 hours post-op. Oh my Um, gosh. It lasted a long while, about 45 minutes. And following that, we had a totally different baby on our hands. He lost all of his milestones where he had been sitting up. He had been rolling over. He was developmentally on track. He no longer could hold his head up. His eyes weren't working in unison. He lost the ability to suck and swallow. He had to be tube fed. He wasn't tracking objects or reaching for toys. Oh felt goodness. like he just wasn't even waking up necessarily. He was Always still... agitated. Yeah, he yeah. was like just he was... in this totally different state. Maybe it was some of the medications. We gave it time for all that to wear off. He just wasn't there anymore, that same baby. You said he had to be 15 pounds. So how old was he when he had the double switch? He was just prior to turning six months old. He was (gasps) over nine pounds at birth. So it didn't take him all that long to get there. (laughs) He was was a big boy. Okay, Aaron, you're a saint. Oh my God. Well, his younger brother was actually 10, 12. So yeah, he's one of the smaller kids. Okay. The good thing it's uh, six months, their brains are still kind of like jello. I mean, they're That's still very elastic. Yeah, yeah. They, the PT, OT were all started. They said that baby's brains are amazingly plastic. They can form new pathways, relearn all of his lost skills. And he did. He did just that. So really oral aversion and the tube feeding was probably the inconvenient at the time. From my friends who have had babies who have been too fed, that is one of the most life-changing events to happen to them both when they get the tube and then when the tube is removed. Right, right. He still had the NG. He never did get the G button because his pacemaker was actually kind of blocking access. He had an abdominal (sighs) pacemaker. And so they would have had to move that and nobody really wanted to touch him at that point. They they were like, let's just leave this kid alone for a little while (laughs) and and see how he does. So, wow. Okay, okay. Wow. Well, you said the magical name, Dr. Edward Beauvais. Did it just happen to be that you were at the hospital where he worked or had you done research in that six months to go to the hospital where the best surgeon was located? Well, it took a lot of research, actually. And for a condition like CCTGA, there was not a whole lot of information out on the internet in 2007 about it. We happened to stumble upon a group of parents with kids with CCTGA on a Yahoo listserv. So this was pre-Facebook for me. I was not even on Facebook. I was on a Yahoo listserv. <laughs> so, yes. So there was a Yahoo listserv yep. and we introduced ourselves and told everybody that we had this child and this is what we've been told about him. And our doctor here, but at the time of diagnosis, he said, we think when he's 15 pounds, he should get this surgery called the double switch. And he presented his case to our local surgeons And they actually wanted to take a wait and see approach. They did not want to intervene at 15 pounds. And so that kind of caught me off guard because one thing I I just wanted it over with. I wanted him to have his surgery and move on and let's live our life and go back to normal. And I wanted him fixed. Then the other part kind of made me nervous. I thought, well, if they want to just see how he does like this, maybe it's because they don't have the experience with it. I know it's a rare 
condition and only like half a percent of all congenital heart defects are CCTGA. And so maybe they haven't seen as many cases. So that's reasonable. I shared that update with the group and several people answered back and said, whoa, 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 you need to maybe get a second opinion. And I kept seeing the same surgeons in the same hospitals as places that people had had good outcomes. We took our child here and we took our child here and we've never looked back and we had a great outcome. And so I asked our cardiologist if he would send Conway's records and information to those surgeons. And Dr. Beauvais was one of them. One was in Boston, one was in Michigan, and one was in California. And oh, so, wow. Now, where are you located? We're in St. Louis, Missouri. So, oh, wow. So you were going to have a trip no matter where. No matter what. It, we oh. were looking at traveling quite a distance. Oh. Yes. Okay. So, so it turned out that our cardiologist here had had a relationship with the University of Michigan. He had done his fellowship in pediatric cardiology at Michigan, and he already knew Dr. Beauvais and knew of him. And so that was one thing that kind of swayed us toward Michigan. Now, the biggest thing was that Dr. Beauvais called us himself to share his opinion on both what procedure Connie needed as well as when to do the procedure. He spent like 45 minutes on the phone going over all the details, answering any questions we had. We did get an email from Boston and our cardiologist actually persuaded us not to even attempt to get an opinion from California. So we didn't, but Dr. Beauvais and the one from Boston both agreed exactly on the timing and the procedure. When we had the opinions matched from Michigan and from Boston, and they were different from what our St. Louis opinion was, we felt confident in moving forward with the double switch in the timing. And then because of that relationship that our cardiologist had with Michigan, having been a fellow there years and years before, we thought that ongoing follow-up and ongoing communication between the two physicians would be better off in the long run. And that makes so much sense. When I was on that Yahoo listserv, people called Dr. Beauvais the man with the golden hands. <laughs> Did they? Yeah. Did you never see that? Maybe that was just in my generation because my kid's 26. So he's a little bit older than your kiddo is. But yeah, he was known as the man with the golden hands. And there were stories all over the Yahoo listserv about people who went from all over the world to have Dr. Beauvais operate on him and that he would take babies that other surgeons didn't want to touch because they didn't want to ruin their stats. <laughs> That's right. And we, when we were at Michigan for his double switch, there were a number of families who were from out of the country, out of state, all over the place and had interpreters and the oh, whole nine wow. yards. Wow. So did you feel really blessed to be where you were? We did. And especially when things didn't go as well as we thought that they would have. And when things took a turn, we were extra extra happy that we were where we were because had that come up somewhere where they had had less experience, who knows what could have happened or what could the outcome have been. And he's had a number of procedures now. How is he doing now? He's thriving. He has had some bumps in the road. He's required some tune-ups, we like to say, or some maintenance. But at 14 months of age, he started eating orally again. He was walking by 18 months, so a little delayed in that. He did get some speech therapy, and that seemed to be our only residual concern by preschool. At two years old, though, he did develop chronic atrial flutter. And so he had had several cardioversions, and he was put on a strong antiarrhythmic medication, but he continued to have breakthrough episodes, and that wreaked havoc on his already precarious heart. And that caused him to go into severe heart failure. Both his mitral and aortic valves were in need of repair. And given how hard it was being out of town for six weeks for the first surgery, we kind of wanted to see what our local hospital could do for him since it wasn't as big of a surgery as the double switch. However, they suggested transplant. So our cardiologist immediately reached out to Dr. Beauvais, again, for his opinion, And we heard back right away that he thought he would be able to fix the valves and that he knew a brilliant electrophysiologist at U of M who was going to perform an ablation to eradicate the atrial flutter. That surgery was a huge success. We were home in five or six days after surgery. He had a wonderful preschool experience after that. He even played soccer. 
And then kindergarten came around and right before he was starting kindergarten, his RV to PA conduit needed to be changed. He had kind of outgrown it since it was put in when he was six months old and Gore-Tex doesn't really grow with you. Exactly. Um, they went ahead and upgraded his pacing system to a biventricular model, which would enable the ventricles to work in better synchrony. And then he sailed along for the rest of early elementary school ages beautifully for six more years. And then his battery was nearing its end just before sixth grade and his atrial lead also had worn out. So he had surgery to replace those. However, in Conway typical fashion, he doesn't do anything easily. So his new lead was infected with pseudomonas and had to get removed a month later. He was very stable from a clinical standpoint, and that missing lead didn't really seem to be affecting him in any way. So they opted to just leave well enough alone, see how long he could go. This past winter, another lead started acting up. So just this past May, a couple months ago, he had two new leads placed along with a new pacemaker battery. So we're crossing our fingers that he's good to go for another five or so years, but his mitral valve has started to stenose a bit. Dr. Beauvais put a ring in it when he was two years old and that ring has kind of stretched to its max. And he, so he's got a little bit of mitral stenosis right now, kind of a moderate level of it. So we're keeping an eye on that. He's grown so much. He's six foot one inch tall right now at 14 <laughs> years of age. Oh my so God. he is so big. And I know that the teenage years kind of sometimes put a little bit of stress on the heart. And that's what I think we're seeing right now. But he's attended regular school. He's participated in typical activities, scouts, chess, robotics, golf, archery, swimming, skiing, you name it. His big passion, though, like most boys his age, video gaming, VR, the whole thing. He, he's all into video games. In high school, looking forward, he plans on being involved in golf and archery and maybe being on the tech crew and the golf team. I think he might even go for bowling. I'm trying to convince him to run cross country, but that might be a little bit of a stretch. And he has started jogging with his sister, so I'm counting that as a win, but we'll see. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, the Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. In segment two, we were talking to Aaron about Conway's progress as a CCTGA heart warrior. But in this segment, we have the pleasure of meeting the surgeon who operated on Conway. My longtime listeners will remember Dr. Edward Beauvais from season nine. His show was entitled Advancements in Treatments for HLHS Heart Warriors. Dr. Beauvais is a cardiac surgeon at CS Mott Children's Hospital and chair of the Department of Cardiac Surgery at University of Michigan Health System, is an internationally acclaimed board-certified pediatric cardiac and thoracic surgeon, and the chair of the Hearts Unite the Globe Medical Advisory Board. Earlier this year, Dr. Beauvais was awarded the 2021 Earl Bakken Scientific Achievement Award by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons during the organization's virtual 57th annual meeting. Welcome back to Heart to Heart with Anna, Dr. Beauvais, and congratulations on your award. Thank you so much, Anna. It's so nice to be with you again, and thank you for mentioning the Bakken Award. That was truly an unexpected surprise and a great honor for me. 
If you look at the list of previous winners, it's pretty amazing. I'm very proud to be included among them. Well, I'm not surprised that your name is amongst some of those notable surgeons because I know firsthand from having spoken to so many people over the last 26 years that you do amazing work, just like the work you've done with Conway on so many children all over the world. Thank you again, Anna. It's very kind of you to say that. It's been a very rewarding career and watching children like Conway grow up and now be as tall as I am and probably play golf a lot better than I do. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite a reward. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, these young kids, they just blossom, don't they? Six, one though. That's amazing. That's amazing. Let's get started in this interview by having you give us a brief historical perspective on the treatment of babies with CCTGA. The issue with CCTGA is it's not one condition. There's a whole variety of problems that go along with it, depending on whether you have associated conditions. So Conway, for example, had an associated VSD plus pulmonary stenosis plus, as we found out in the operating room, he had something called a straddling mitral valve, which meant that the attachments of his valve were attached on both sides of the heart, which would normally make it a completely unrepairable problem. So that's part of the issue that led to such a complex repair. So if you're born with CCTGA and you have no associated conditions, well, then in reality, it's not what your mom told you because two wrongs make a right in that the blue blood (laughs) winds up in the lungs, even though it goes through the wrong heart chambers, and the red blood gets to the body. So you really don't have any symptoms. You could potentially live an entirely normal life, die of old age, and never know yet a heart defect. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. But what we don't know is what percentage of actual people who have that in fact, wind up with no symptoms. And what we do know is that if you develop problems, and we know many of these children do, then the prognosis, unfortunately, is extremely poor. So if you have a VSD, if you have pulmonary stenosis, then you're going to require surgery. Mm -hmm. The old way of repairing a heart defect like this was to close the VSD repair the pulmonary stenosis as best one could, but then you'd leave the right ventricle, the anatomic right ventricle, to pump to the body. Unfortunately, when you close the VSD and relieve the pulmonary stenosis, that would change the configuration of the ventricle so that many of these patients then developed a leaking tricuspid valve Mm -hmm. and right ventricular failure. Mm -hmm. At that point, you have almost no options. The heart would then begin to deteriorate generally pretty rapidly. And the only option would be to do a heart transplant. Right, right. So it was this sort of thing that I think stimulated a lot of heart surgeons and other specialists in congenital heart disease to think about doing what's called the anatomic repair. And that's the double switch that you've alluded to, whereby you actually correct everything and make the left ventricle be the chamber that pumps to the body. That's a very complicated operation, no doubt about it, but it leads really to much better results. It does lead to much better results from some of the research that I've looked at. Friends, remember, I'm just a heart mom, (laughs) so I'm not looking at it from a doctor's perspective. But the thing that's scary to me is it is usually a very, very complicated procedure. How often do you actually do the double switch on babies with CCTG? Well, we we do get a lot of referrals. And I think myself, my colleagues have probably done somewhat north of 150 of these double switches now. And having a very large experience has really helped us learn a lot of tricks, if you will, so that we've made the operation smoother. We've tried to do a lot of things which tend to eliminate long-term complications. I think it's also very important to remember that As a heart surgeon, I don't really cure the heart. I can't make the heart normal. What I'm trying to do is convert the child's heart defect into something that can be more easily treated throughout his or her life. If you need a heart transplant, well, that's pretty dire and obviously carries severe implications. But if you need a pacemaker or even if you need a conduit change or something like that, and I don't mean to make light of it because obviously it's surgery, but on the other hand, they're treatable they're much more associated with a better long-term life. And I think that's why we've really felt that the double switch operation is a much more appropriate operation in the appropriate patients. Right. How old are the oldest 
children who have had the double switch operation? See, that's a, that's difficult for me to answer. I think it depends maybe on someone's experience, but I think I've certainly now have children that have reached probably their 20s that have had this operation because we started doing it quite some time ago, admittedly, very selectively as we were learning how to do it and what was the best approach and who should have the operation. But by and large, I think it's led to better outcomes. You also have to remember that we've begun to branch out and now we're tending to see sometimes young babies, infants, even neonates who are born with CCTGA and right off the bat, they already show signs of right ventricular dysfunction. In other words, a weak Mm. right ventricle. Mm. And we know that the prognosis for these babies is very poor. Right. If you don't do anything in early infancy, the left ventricle, which is normally the high pressure one, begins to weaken because it doesn't have to do as much work. It only has to pump blood to the lungs. Mm -hmm. So you've lost the golden opportunity to do the double switch and allow the left ventricle to take over more work. In many of those patients, we're able to retrain the left ventricle by putting Mm -hmm. what's called a pulmonary artery band on Mm -hmm. the pulmonary artery, which is essentially narrowing the pulmonary artery to increase the pressure in the left ventricle. But we know that that's not as good as having a left ventricle that's been trained right from birth. So As we learn more and as we see more patients, we are really trying to understand, as I mentioned a minute ago, who are the best candidates? Who should we do it on? Should we do that operation on, for example, a newborn Mm -hmm. who may be asymptomatic, but we know the prognosis is very poor? I wish I had those answers. I don't know. I would predict that in reality and not terribly distant future, that's what we'll be doing. Well, 14 years ago, they said that Conway needed to be 15 pounds before he was operated on. You couldn't do that on a neonate unless you had a really, really big baby. (laughs) And I wouldn't want to be the mother delivering that baby. Has that standard changed in the last 14 years? Oh, oh, yeah. In fact, the very first child I ever did the operation on was referred to us from out of state and was, I think, was five pounds something. We had no option. This baby had a failing right ventricle that was clearly not going to get very far. The baby had been on a ventilator since the baby was born, and the baby was now something like three or four months of age. And we did a double switch, and the child did perfectly well. Oh, wow. What you a great success it. story. Yeah, you can do it on younger babies. Now, again, Conway, as I'm sure Aaron will agree, Conway is quite exceptional. Mm -hmm. He presented some very unique problems that I candidly think most surgeons would have never even tried to undertake because of the straddling valve, the asymmetry of the ventricles. The right ventricle was already failing. There were so many issues with Conway that we felt that despite all of that, we needed to do that operation. And in him in particular, I wouldn't really have wanted to do it when he was very small. I think that would have really only increased the complexity. That makes a lot of sense because when they're a little bit bigger, it's got to be easier for you to work inside their hearts. It still amazes me that you surgeons can operate on an infant's heart when the heart is only about the size of a walnut. That just really amazes me. Well, we have very good magnifying glasses. I think that's what helps. (laughs) I'm sure you do. Do you do a lot of robotic surgery? No, to be honest with you, I don't think that's really had a very significant impact on congenital heart surgery. And it's for the reason, frankly, that you just mentioned, the babies we operated on are pretty small. The technology is really not there yet. There are some situations where you can use it, but I don't think it's really been significant in our field. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal ball and tell me, what do you predict for the future of babies born with CCTGA? I know you already alluded to a couple of things, but give us your grand prediction. Again, I think you have to go back and look and see a baby born with CCTGA. Do they have associated conditions such as the VSD or pulmonary stenosis? And remember, the conduction, electrical problems, that's pretty common in these babies. Even without surgery, they develop all sorts of these problems. But I think if they have no associated conditions, in my mind, that's the most difficult decision to make. And I did allude to it a minute ago. If they're born with no associated conditions and have a perfectly normally functioning heart, it's pretty hard to justify putting them through a big operation when you're not sure if maybe leaving them alone would have resulted in a perfectly normal lifespan. If there's any indication, however, that the right ventricle is beginning to weaken 
and the tricuspid valve, which is the valve that's inside the right ventricle, is beginning to leak, then I think it's very justified now to be, I'll use the word aggressive, and that doesn't sound always right, but to be relatively aggressive in saying those babies should undergo double switch operations. And quite candidly, I don't think it's all that difficult to do that, just like we do arterial switch operations for babies with DTGA, I think we can certainly do that for babies with CCTGA. And that's what I would recommend be done. In an older child, say beyond a few months or even a few years, if they develop a weakening of the right ventricle later in life, right now the best technology we have is to try to retrain the left ventricle, as I mentioned earlier, with a pulmonary artery band. But quite candidly, we know that that's not ideal. In some patients, it works very well. In other patients, it's not so good. So that's the challenge that we have. And I don't think we really have a good answer yet. And it's why I think we're tending to lean more towards doing these double switch operations earlier in life when the left ventricle is fully trained and able to go through an entire lifespan, which is not the case if you allow the pressure in the left ventricle to diminish. And we've seen that with other heart procedures as well, where they would try and wait to let the baby get bigger, but then they might start to develop other problems and some of them didn't survive. Isn't that true? The reality of it is waiting often is not the best thing to do. One might think that that's going to lower the risk, but it actually increases it in many of the conditions that we treat. Right. I am so glad that Conway had you. I think it was a blessing that his local doctor had trained in Michigan and that he was sent to you because it sounds like he was a really complicated case. Well, he was, and I think I'm expecting him to give me a golf lesson now in the near future. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Aaron, I'm going to bring you back into the studios. Thank you so much for giving me an excuse to bring Dr. Beauvais back on the program. It was so much fun to talk to you and to get to know a little bit more about Conway and his condition. Well, thank you again for having me. And I just, again, want to express our gratitude to Dr. Beauvais and his whole team at Mott Children's because they gave us such a gift. And we just hope that his testimony that we shared today can give some hope to others who might just be learning about this diagnosis. Oh, I love that. And I'm sure you will be giving a lot of hope to other people who hear this program. Dr. Bove, thank you so much for coming back on the program and explaining this really complicated condition to us in terms that all of us could understand. Well, Anna, thanks. It's always a joy to be with you. And Aaron, it's so nice to talk to you again, and I hope you'll give Conway a big hug from me. I will. Thank you. I love that. Friends, I hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as I have. Please consider becoming a patron of our program for the cost of a pizza. You could be a patron for a whole year. Just head on over to Patreon. That's www.patreon.com slash heart to heart to learn more and join our team. That does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.